We're going to continue on our series on intentional use of technology, the, uh, the dangers of technology is what we'll be looking at this morning. We looked at the history of technology, how um, technology was used through history, how that related to Christianity, and in four weeks we'll be looking at how to actually live this out practically, the intentional use of technology. And I think, like I said last time, these sermons could feel a little unbalanced by themselves. So if you can take in all of them, I think that would, uh, would probably would feel a little bit more balanced. So we'll first look at, we're going to look at the dangers of technology in three areas this morning. First of all, slavery. How technology can enslave us and become the ruler of us, use us instead of us using it. And then sin. How technology can tempt us to sin. And then also surveillance, how our devices can be used to spy on us, and a few ways to avoid each of these things. There's, I like this quote. It said, the difference between technology and slavery is that slaves are fully aware that they are not free. And don't we all fall into that sometimes? We're not free. We're, we're enslaved, and we don't even realize it. So I think um, starting to realize that is, is the first step. A few statistics. In 2022, people spent 12 and a half trillion hours looking at screens. Americans spend approximately seven hours every day looking at a screen. And about two and a half hours of that every day is on social media. It sounds like slavery to me. But just because you maybe don't use technology that much, don't pat yourself on the back and say, well, it's not a problem for me. I think we all need to, to look at it honestly and see if, we are being enslaved by technology. We use our phones all different places. We use them in church. Sometimes um, we use our phones in bed. We use our phones while we're driving. We look at our phones while we're trying to have conversations. And those are not good places. And so let's be intentional about that. I'm going to tell you to do something I don't usually do. I'm going to tell you to get your phone out if you have it with you. And if you don't have it with you, kudos for, to you. But if you do, I'd like you to, to do this and look at how many hours you were looking at your phone screen last, last, in the last week. Uh, if you're on an Android phone, uh, you can go to settings, and, and you, there's usually like battery or device care. And it tells you what, what app used the most battery. And that's a good clue towards um, how much you used your phone in the last week. If you have an iPhone, you can go to settings and then um, scroll down to screen time and you can see a little bit about how much time you, you, uh, you, you spent on your phone in the last week. Uh, you, uh, yeah, if you go to screen time and then it, it's a little bit more complicated, you go to see all websites and activity and then if you swipe over to the right, you can see the last week. And for me, this was a week, this was Thanksgiving week. I was busy around home, and I didn't spend much time on, so this is better than I usually do, so just full disclosure. But um, you can see how much time you used on each different app. You can see how many times you picked up your phone and turned it on every, every, uh, every day, uh, which, how many notifications you got, all these things. And then if uh, I, would, I would really encourage you... Um, to show it to the person next to you if you're, if you're brave enough to do that because that kind of transparency and openness is how you win. Thank you very much, Titus. And see what you think. How have you been doing? And if you need some help from the person beside you or your spouse or whoever, get that help. Another practical thing I have liked is a book I recently went through called How to Break Up with Your Phone by Katherine Price. It's just a very, very practical book with practical ideas of things to do. It is also secular. It's not Christian-based, so, you know, there are some things in there I wouldn't advise, um, so like some meditation and not the good kind of meditation. So there's a few things you want to you be alert to, but it's just a lot of really, really practical ideas on how to use your phone wisely and use it less. But I really prefer heart change that drives practical change to practical changes by themselves, even though both can be useful. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32 and verse 34, so Jesus was saying to these Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Are you a slave or are you free? And Jesus is going to be the one that can make you free, being a disciple of Jesus. I would like to read, turn, I'd like you to turn to Romans 6, and you can do this on your phone if you would like to, or your paper Bible, it's up to you. But I would like to read this whole chapter because there's so much about freedom and slavery and how we get to that freedom and slavery, how we find it. And I just, I just really liked it. And even if, if our phone isn't enslaving us to sin specifically, if we're enslaved to it, even doing good things, it's still not good. So I'm going to read through Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. I have to crucify that and be a slave to Christ, not a slave to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive, in God, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of, righteous, of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart that, to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in hum human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your bodies as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's just so much there about contrasting that freedom to slavery. And we can be free to sin if we're not enslaved to Christ, but when we're free in Christ, we're slaves to Christ and free from sin. And we're going to move on to part two, sin, and the, the temptation that technology can bring. And this is maybe to many of us the most obvious danger. But I'm not actually going to spend, I'm going to spend the least time on this section because I think we understand it, we realize it. It could easily be a whole sermon in itself, but just to, to look a little bit at the way that technology can tempt us. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And technology can touch us in many different areas of our life, but probably most especially in the area of the lust of the eyes, what we see, but it can, it can tempt us in many different ways. So I'd like to hear from you. What temptations do we face? How does te technology tempt us? How does it tempt you? I'd like to, to hear your input. Buy things you don't need. Robbing. Robbing our time for more important things. 
Lots of interesting things that really don't benefit. I thought of idolatry. We, we, can, we can worship technology. We can think that it's the solution to all our problems. But I read a quote a while back, and I wish I could find it again. I wasn't able to. I'm going to quote it as best I can. I don't remember who said it, so I, I can't give credit. But something along the lines that all the problems we face today come from yesterday's technology, and it's going to continue to be the case in the future. And, and that's overstated. We know that not all our problems today come from yesterday's technology. But I think the point stands that many of the things we face are today are unintended consequences of technology. You know, you think of asbestos was a great insulation, and then suddenly people are dying of cancer from it. And just, it, it goes on and on. There are many things like that. And then, of course, the immorality, illicit relationships, whether they're real or virtual, pornography, all of that um, is, is just a huge trap that, that traps so many people. How else does technology tempt us? Anyone else? A lack of contentment, kind of, um, you know, I see the, the latest and greatest thing and I want it or someone else has a better life or a better vacation or a better house or whatever it might be. And rob our contentment. And why? So why does techno why does why is technology so so tempting to us? Why does it why does it have that allure that it does? Time with God. Mm-hmm. Can take away from our spending time with God. It's a self reinforcing cycle. Critical thinking is is really important. We don't need to think; we just research, or we, uh, or, or or it takes away our our time our, our time to be quiet and think and, and meditate in a healthy way. It's a way to escape. We have something difficult. This is something easy. We don't like easy. We don't like hard things. We like easy. in on the difficult, complex thing of wanting to improve in a good way and feeding the pride and ego within a person, making things look unrealistic and with today's ability to create pictures that aren't real, Mm -hmm. it feeds on the negative. But I think there's also one of the slippery sides of it is there's also a desire, I think, within each one of us to improve, mm-hmm. and that, is, that can also become a trap. And, of course, having, you know, a phone or whatever device with us makes it easy, and uh, and there's always the, the temptation is always there, always with us at our weak points or whenever. It makes it more available, easier to hide. It brings lots of new and novel things, and our brains are wired to like new and novel things, and so we can see the latest funny or interesting or educational or whatever type of thing that, that distracts us. So how can we win? What are some strategies to win? Because it's a battle, and we need to be prepared if we're going to win. Being aware, being open, being honest about where we struggle, where we have failed. It'd be good if we would try and recognize clickbait, like when people are trying to uh, get us to open their link or watch their video or read some article, and it's because it is written a certain way to get our attention. Try to discern the motive, like what. Uh, it, what, am, what, what is this article, link, whatever, trying to get me to do? And is that what I want to do? And that goes back to intentionality. That 
people are actually trying to have us think in a given pattern to reach a certain destination. And think of Christ saying, uh, renewing of our minds through the Word of God versus through some social platform that's entertaining, yeah, perhaps. And of course, it goes into outright evil. But to understand the fact that that it is a platform where people are actually trying to help us think a certain pattern in a certain way. Yeah, again, just looking at that motive, like what, what, where, where is this going? Jesse. When to set our sights higher, it's a little bit like if a dog's chewing a bone it's not supposed to chew. You can tell the dog not to chew the bone and tell it not to chew the bone. And most likely, it's you go out the next time, it's still going to be chewing that bone. Unless you give it something else, mm -hmm. something better, something greater. And it's, it's very d difficult to win if it's all about no, mm -hmm. unless we can change our sights and set it on something deeper, something higher. And we probably recognize that in our children, but do we recognize it in ourselves? Look for something better, because there is. Um, you know, all of these things, you can go and, you know, play games for free and take, you know, social media, every app is, you know, quote, free. But it's not free when it takes time from us. And if you calculate the value of that time, if you would do the, 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 the amount of time that Americans spend on screens, and you would multiply that out, um, the amount of money that they're, just in financial terms, the amount of money that that's worth to them. And, you know, if you understand that our time is the most valuable asset that every one of us has, um, both for in terms of finances, but even more importantly in terms of the kingdom and our families and those kind of things, and understanding that free is not free if it robs our time. Mm -hmm. Understand the, the attention economy. That's, that's the currency that so much, well, uh, you know, the internet runs on. What about confession? Confess to God. Confess to other people when we've not been in a good place, whatever that might, whatever that might look like. And, and uh, as you mentioned, Jesse, moving towards something. And I think relationship with God and relationship with others is the key part of that. Building relationships with others, building our relationship with God. Um, healthy physical activities, do something physical. Sitting on the couch is not, not going to build you physically, just, just a, as a purely physical thing. Remember that God sees and knows. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and good. Think about this. If Jesus was sitting beside me, would I still be comfortable doing what I'm doing? Um, because you probably can hide this from your spouse or your parents or your children for a while, but you can't forever. And God does know, and, you're, and, and the people around you will know. Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into fiery hell. And I would say if your phone causes you to stumble, get rid of it. It's better to go through life without a smartphone than to burn in hell. And that sounds radical perhaps, but that's far less radical than what Jesus was saying. And I think if that's what it takes for a time or for always, don't keep living in defeat. It's worth that. What about as parents? What should we be doing for our children? How, we, how can we help our children navigate this? Some of us didn't grow up with a lot of screens. Others did. But what can we be doing for our children? games right and mm -hmm. my parents had a standard we don't play computer games and I didn't like that so much when I was little other people had them and you know, we weren't allowed to have computer games but you know as a result of that not my time not being occupied by something worthless I actually filled it with something good mm -hmm. and I actually did things that really benefited me and prepared me for life and were worthwhile and if I would had those other things that would have robbed thousands of hours from me that in growing up years I wouldn't be able to put into into other worthwhile things. So sometimes we just simply have to put limits on it and say, you know what, we're not going to allow our children to waste time because I'm not sure that many times when they're little they have the ability to make that judgment call. 
So two things, you said example. I think that's so powerful. If you're telling your children you can't waste time on screens, but that's all you're doing, it's, it's worse than not saying it at all. And, and, and do set standards, whatever that might be, could be different for each family, but, but be sure you're intentional about that and, and do set limits uh, that, that will be healthy for them. How else can we help our children? Now, the thing is, is that the relationships, an open, transparent, honest relationship, if they're struggling with something, whatever it might be, are you willing to listen? Can you hear what they're, uh, you know, when, when they're, are you open to listen when they have a confession to make? Do physical activities. Again, that thing of doing something physical. It's good for them. It's good for you to get off the couch even if you're feeling tired that day. Next, we're going to look at surveillance and, and um I don't want to create fear by this um, section, and I really struggled how to present this because there are some people who need to have more awareness, and there are some people who need to be a little less fearful, and so I don't know which you are, but I'm going to try to really hard to present realities of things that we know to be so. Uh, there are many, many conspiracy theories, and, and I just want to, I'm going to try really hard to stay with things we know to be true that are, re are realities, and then some intentional ways to address that. So why does it matter? Why does it matter if people snoop... Um, you know, hopefully Christians should be the most honest, transparent people. If people look at what they're doing, it should be good and above board. And reality is most of the time we shouldn't. I hope that anyone snooping on my communications would see that I'm a real Christian and that what I say I also do and that I'm not doing something different in private when no one's looking than I, than I, than I speak on Sunday morning. And I hope that anyone snooping on what I'm doing, it might be a witness to them. I really do. But there are times and places when it does matter. I have conversations with my wife that I would prefer to, that they would stay private. Um, in business, we have trade secrets. There are things, business dealings, that just they're private. They don't need to be public. And as we live in a world and a, um, and a government that's more hostile towards Christianity, there are times and places when keeping our communication private might save us some persecution. And there are a lot of different examples of private information being used wrongly. There's blackmail when a, you know, a person or a government tries to take someone's private information and say, well, if you don't do what I want you to do, we're going to make this public and we're going to embarrass you. Um, although Christians, I think, should be far less susceptible to that, again, because if we're living the same life on the inside and the outside, it should be less important, but it still can, it still can be the case for sure. There are a couple examples. One... Um, it's a story of, in Miami-Dade County in Florida, there were police officers who were speeding dangerously when they were off-duty. And so because they were police officers, the other police officers were kind of afraid to, to pull them over. But one, one officer did that, and the others who had been speeding searched her information in their online database and were able to find who she was and all her contact information and threatened her because of that, because she had dared to call them out on what they were doing. There's another story of a man of two people driving, and they had an altercation while they were driving. I'm not sure exactly what kind of road rage or whatever was going on. And the first driver had a, uh, a friend who was a police officer, so he called him and was able to get from the license plate number all the contact information of the other man. And he called him up and threatened him and his wife and, and just really was, was using that information to threaten. So there's examples of when private information should be private. So if you're using electronics or not even, what can be tracked? What do people know? What can be found out by the government or hackers or whoever else? Almost everything that you do or search or type or read anywhere you go online can be tracked. Anywhere you physically go, driving a car that has a license plate or carrying your phone can be tracked. Messages, calls, what you buy, every email you send, every file you save to Google Drive, how and when you're online, what posts you look at on social media, how long you look at each post, how you move your mouse or what links you click on. And it's not just the sites that you're on, Facebook and Google particularly track you across wherever you go in, ma in many cases. And we're tracked by online stores, search engines, social media companies, hackers, scammers, and governments. So anything. And there are some things you can do to minimize this. 
I do some of these things, but not all of them. So they're, they're ideas. And if I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, <coughs> if you need to, to <coughs> if you'd like to understand them better, do some research or ask someone to help you. <coughs> Probably the number one thing you can do to keep your information private is use an encrypted messaging app. Signal is one of the most secure ones I know of. Telegram is a close second. Another thing you can do <coughs> is set your chats to automatically delete over time so that if someone does get a hold of your phone, you don't have a lifetime of chats. If you're concerned about that, you can do it on each chat. If you say, hey, this one is private, I want to make sure people don't get to read that one. WhatsApp and iMessage with the blue bubble are, are better, um, not as good than, than say like, uh, but SMS, text messages, emails, Facebook Messenger are not private, not at all. Uh, another thing you can do if you're really concerned about a conversation, make a call through your, uh, through your encrypted messaging app. That's a really good way to do it. Lock your phone. Put a lock, lock your phone so that people can't just pick it up and look at it. And not a swipe pattern. That's really easy to break into. If you're going through immigration, immigration is a time when they can take your phone and search it. If you turn it off, before you go through immigration, they can turn it on, but they can't unlock it. And it's really interesting, but there's a little loophole in U.S. law that they can require you to use your thumbprint or your face to unlock your phone, but they can't make you use your passcode. So when you turn your phone on, usually it's asked for your passcode. They cannot legally require you to, to give that up. And they won't tell you that. They may ask you, but you don't need to, if you ever want to know that. Um, if apps ask to track your location or give you notifications or whatever all permissions they ask to do, say no, unless you really need that. Um, if you have an iPhone, you can turn on lockdown mode. It's fairly simple to do. Go to settings and um, privacy and security. You can turn on lockdown mode. It, it makes it a lot more secure. And it'll tell you all the features you'll have to give up, but most of them are not uh, super necessary. Use a password manager. Use a different password for every service you use, and a password manager can help you remember those, because otherwise you will not remember them all. Use multi-factor authentication, more than just a, a username and password, especially on accounts that are, that are important. Delete the apps you're not using. You can always put them back on if you need them. It's not hard. Keep your, your software up to date. Allow updates to happen automatically. Another thing is uh, newer electronics are more secure. Um, there's a high profile case where s the government was trying to hack into someone's phone and because he had a phone that was a few generations old, they were able to get in. Now don't use this as an ex don't tell your wife that I said you have to buy a new phone, but um, it is true. Newer phones are more secure. Use an ad blocker, can block some of that tracking. Use a private search engine like DuckDuckGo. Don't reply to people you don't know. This is more security than privacy, but hackers and scammers are out to get you, and they will impersonate people you think you know, they will hack their accounts, and they will send you a message. I'm stuck in Italy and I need some money, please help me. And these are very much easier, don't, don't laugh. Um, it's not a matter of uh, if you will fall for these, it's when. Be very careful. I have um, absolutely fallen for one of these, almost um, gave away several thousand dollars due to a mistake at work. Um, so it happens. Be careful. Don't give your account information away, your usernames or your passwords to people over the phone or in messages. If you want to share it with someone you trust, your wife or whatever, your spouse, give it to them in person, not, not electronically. And just be mindful and intentional and moderate in your use of electronics. Pay attention. Think about what you're doing. Don't panic because people are watching you. They are. It, panicking won't help anything. And don't feel that you have to do all of these things. But maybe pick one thing you can do to, to make your, your, your life more secure and more private and see if you can do it today. So in closing, technology presents three, at least three dangers. The three we looked at were slavery. We can serve technology instead of it serving us. Sin, temptation, comes to us through technology. And surveillance, our private information going where we wouldn't like it to. So in four weeks, we're going to look at how to use technology in an intentional, godly way. But if we're serving God with all our heart, we won't be slaves to anything besides God. And if we're alive in Christ and dead to sin, then temptation won't have the pool that it used to. 
And if we're living an upright life and being wise about our digital lives, then we can minimize the harm of surveillance. So God bless you as you intentionally use technology.